So for the last few weeks, I've been in Hamburg, Germany, recording an album for an artist named Roofman. It's his debut record. And the studio that we've been working at, Clouds Hill, is my favorite studio I've had the opportunity to work in yet. It's an analog recording studio. We've been live tracking full band in the room to tape, working the old school way. This is a super cool studio filled with lots of amazing vintage gear, beautiful rooms. They really have an amazing setup here. So uh, this is gonna be a little bit longer video, but I'm really excited to show you guys how this whole thing works. So let's run upstairs and uh, meet Johan. This is Cloud Hill Studios in Hamburg, Germany. My name is Johan Scherer. I'm running the studio for 16 years now. Actually, I built it in 2005. We're in the middle of an album production. You wanna yeah. have a look around? Yeah, absolutely. So where did this start for you? Like what, what, what was the kind of genesis behind wanting to build a studio like this? Well, I've been a musician all my life basically. And then at some point I just started to build my own home studio with a mini disc, eight track. Um, and then I started working in different studios and at some point um, I got my first kit when I was super young and I kind of wanted to be self-employed and do my own thing. And I opened up a studio with a friend, with a shared recording room. And then I found this place and it was, well, it was a thousand square meters of nothing. It was just a warehouse with nothing in it. So I rented a quarter of it, 250 square meters, which is basically just this room. Here used to be a wall and that room. And one of those rooms became the control room and the other one the live room. And then I just started to record bands in here. We built a second floor, 35 centimeters, which is like one foot of damping material, cement and all that kind of stuff. And then put the floor on it. And it's a classic room and room construction. As you can see here, these walls, this wall is not attached in any way to the outer wall. Right. Yeah, it was designed for live recordings. So it needed to stand noise and isolate noise. For this, we're in the middle of an album recording at the moment. So, and it's mainly a live album with a couple of overdubs. Um, so everything is set up in this room and when I do it, I use the overhead of the drums as basically room mics too. You have to do it because there's bleed everywhere. Right. So when I set up the guitars, for example, there's one amp on the right side of the room, a couple of amps on the left side of the room, the bass is usually in the middle because then you don't try to avoid the bleed on the drums, but you use it as the room signal. Right, and it, it matches the stereo It matches field. the stereo panning, the yeah. stereo picture of the actual record, right? Yeah. And I like that because you have to make certain decisions while recording. I like the fact that you have to think about stereo panning while recording. But sometimes you want to crank an amp and that doesn't work. So we have a little booth in here. And the bigger booth in there, currently there's someone doing vocal overdubs in that booth. What we did for the live recording, I, I like that is one of his mics is being fed into this weird amp here. It's a super rare Fradan Echomatic 50. Actually, I've only seen this one in my life. I'm desperately trying to get a second one just for replacements because that thing usually breaks down quite a lot. But that's the, it's the core sound of this amp is the echo almost dying. So basically, oh, you can hear it a little bit. The radio is coming yeah, through. <laughs> it's radio coming out. So his vocals on the live take, his vocals will come from that booth into this amp through this speaker. And then we record it with this, I don't even know what it is in English, that fake hat. In German, maybe Neumann is a German company, so mm. we say the German word. It's a Kunstkopf Mikrofon. I've never seen an orange cabinet like this before. Is this a bass cab? What is this? Yep two 15 inch speakers and I think they call it a reflection cabinet because it has this ramp here and it goes with this amp. Oh yeah, old Matt amp. Yeah, those are sick. It's a sick amp. And the cool thing is this one got a studio mode and a stage mode. <laughs> So the studio mode, I think there is a built-in power socket, something like that. So we have can 
certainly crank the amp without having it too loud. Yeah. So the, the live room is still set up from our live session. And so there's gobos and everything everywhere, partially because I was playing pretty hmm. loud. Yeah. Um, so behind there is, is two amps, the uh, Gibson. That's a 51 G GA50? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's the it, it, we chose it because it has the nicest tremolo it really does. you've ever heard in your entire life. Yeah, and then even it, it's different from an AC30, but uh, it's just so nice. Yeah, there's a few moments on this record where I am uh, running stereo, and it was the 51 GA50, and then the cleanest brown face deluxe I've ever seen. Where did you uh, where'd you find this one? Yeah, it's still got the original Jen Jensen speaker in there. Yeah. You know, stuff like this happens when you're friends with with a great guitar player. And he would always like point you in the right direction. He's like, ah, see that Gibson. Yeah. <laughs> see that deluxe. Yep. That's the one. Yeah. Looks even nicer from the back. So there's a microphone and three instrument uh, inputs. It's a shame that they, they never reissued these amps like Fender did. You know, like right. you can only find the old ones, and a lot of times they're in a, bit, a state of disrepair, but this one sounds great. It sounds great. I think we replaced one of the speakers. He has the high speaker with a Weber speaker. Yeah, but best sounding tremolo I think I've had totally, in the totally. It's amazing. And then the AC30, that's a 64, 65? I don't know, you tell me. Yeah, early 60s, gray panel. It's pretty similar to the one I have at home, which is why I gravitated towards it just incredible amp this one has the uh, silver bulldogs the, uh, the bulldogs in the back which i actually prefer over the blues i know everyone wants the alnico blues yeah but i think this is the one to have you know interesting yeah you tried that amp before with the blues yeah and that sounds more kind of hi-fi that sounds a little more aggressive yeah when i was still a, like an active musician i i played that a lot so yeah i love it especially the tremolo and then what mics were we using on guitars. I get this question a lot, what kind of mics to use on guitar amps? Choosing a microphone for a sound source, first of all, you have to listen to the sound source, and then you have to know how you want it to sound. Like, is that the original sound? Does this piano actually sound great in the room? Or do I have to move it? And, and sometimes a piano sounds great in the room and then you just have to record it and you choose a neutral sounding microphone like a DPA, for example. If the piano, for whatever reason, doesn't sound great in a room, you kind of try to level it out with the microphone that does the job. And that can be a brilliant sounding microphone or the opposite. So what I did on these amps is I listened to the sound and this amp sounded kind of aggressive and I know that you use the pedal that kind of push the highs a little. Mm -hmm. So that's why I use the RCA DC DX77 because it's a ribbon mic. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have much highs. Plus classic 4 to 1 Sennheiser 4 to 1. An early one. An early one for the grip. Yeah. It's just AC30 and 4 to 1, it's a classic, it's a, it's a classic match. You can't go wrong with that one. If it doesn't sound good, something is wrong. Yeah. And I show you my special mic. I hope it's in here. Let me, let me see. My secret weapon. Nope. Yes. So this. Oh. That's a Sennheiser, I forgot the name, MD403. Wow, I've never seen that before. You should buy one. Okay, I'll buy one before this video goes out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, honestly, um, these are my secret weapon for guitars. Put it in front of an amp, sounds super brilliant. It's like a when you have a Sennheiser 421 mm -hmm. and it sounds a bit too muffled and mm -hmm. you put a uh, 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 a condenser microphone next to it to get some more highs. This sounds like you did that. And then we've got a bit of a pedal selection. The thing I like about Johan's pedal collection is there's a lot of stuff that's off the wall. You got a few of the staples, you've got a memory man, you've got a tube screamer, but a lot of this stuff is kind of, you know, off the beaten path a little bit. I just like weird sounds. I think that's what it's all about. When I produce a record, I just don't want to sound it cliche. Most of the time, what I'm trying to do is find a sound that does the job in the song, 
but has an unexpected sound. Right. That one's that one's great in particular. What that is used this? To, that's a that's a it's a fuzz pedal, um, but it has a little friend. The Franken Frankenstein fuzz comes with a little friend called Igor, <laughs> <laughs> and you put it in, and you can actually control the pitch of the fuzz with that little. Thing here. I love the I love the blade switch on there. That's yes. Crazy. Yes, and well, I I didn't play that too much because that's the bass version. I used to have it on bass, but I used to have that on bass as well. That's the guitar version apparently, and I like that too. So with Cloud Sill, we have this effect company called Cloud Sill Effects, and the first thing we did was there's nothing better than a tape delay, right? Right. So what we came up with is this. Because there is one thing that's better than a tape delay, and that's a floppy disk delay. <laughs> In here, there's an actual floppy disk that rotates and gets magnetized and demagnetized, and three heads from a vintage cassette player. You know what? There's a whole video on YouTube only talking about this one, about the features. I'll link it below. And the record we just did features a lot of this. Yeah, I use this a ton, especially with an expression pedal because you can control the speed, the ramp up and down speed of the disc with the expression pedal, and it was wild. We only built 30 of these, almost ruined everything in my life. Because <laughs> <laughs> we spent years developing this. It's just, it's extremely difficult. It's it's still fragile. It's more a studio tool than actually a touring tool. Yeah, so we built 30 and we'll never build more. Maybe if there's some weird dude out there that wants to help us build it and ruin his life instead of ours, <laughs> I'm happy to <laughs> give out a license. But anyways, then we started building a booster called the Laut Vintage Valve Booster. Laut. The Clouds Hill Vintage Valve Booster. It's a push-pull schematic from the 70s, actually like from hi-fi, from the hi-fi world. And what it does, it makes the signal louder. Amazing. What an original idea. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and there's different tubes in here. You can get like an RCA black plate tube, a Telefunken plate uh, tube. And they all sound different, and, and you can really hear the differences of the different tubes. Yeah, and what I was actually using it for, which is sort of atypical of how I would typically use a boost, is putting it at the end of my pedal board right before the amp and actually just using it more like a tube preamp. And what I found was when I was using digital effects like digital modulations and, and some digital reverbs and stuff, it was warming things up and getting rid of a lot of the digitalness of the pedal going into the amp and it was actually a really nice effect yep it's a better maker yeah we to talk about the uh the drums and the mics we got up here sure the... i mean that's that's a deca tree probably all of you know that it's it's a mic <laughs> no no <laughs> no okay it's a it's a microphone array of three microphones all omnidirectional you would pan it left center yeah right? It w originally it was invented for like big recording halls and it would sit right above the orchestra. Okay. And we'll picture the entire orchestra and then you would kind of get the close mics for solos. That you see it quite often like in Abbey Road and those big old fashioned studios. I made a couple of records with that kind of room miking and it always works and always sounds great. Especially it's unconventional you would normally not do that using a Deca tree, but when you have the drums here and the instruments there and the bass coming from there, ah, I'm giving away all my secrets. <laughs> I shouldn't. So that is closer to the drums. So there's a little more presence in the drums in the room mic. And the rest of the amps is more like left and right and the bass is coming from kind of behind it it sounds weird but it all makes sense when you hear it mm -hmm. so we changed the drums on every song obviously we tuned the drums to the right key on every song but we also changed the shells and the cymbals that's the setup of the last song we did it's a i don't know maybe 60s i think so slingerland Radio King set. And the, the setup that you're using is kind of like a blend of uh, a Glenn Johns with the two ribbons here and then and the kick mic, but then you've also got a more conventional setup, the stereo overheads and the close mics. Is that, yeah. you just decide in the mix phase what you're gonna use or for each song? No, I decide in the recording phase. So we started with 
a Glyn Jones using the two T C12s, one here, one uh, coming from from here. Mm -hmm. That didn't sound so cool because Pim, the drummer's setup is kind of is a bit different to conventional setups. His snare is super high and a bit more on the left. So I chose to just do a classic A B overhead to Omnis plus a mono overhead ribbon. And these are cool, these ribbons. I've never seen these before. What are these? Um, those are called Melodium 42N. They're being produced by a recording studio in France called Curwax Studios. Actually, this is the main microphone for the whole set. Interesting. You know what it is? It looks like a 121 from the 1950s, but it's... Yes, but it isn't. It's a Bang & Olufsen. Ah. And now you know why a Roya microphone looks like a Roya microphone. Right, because of this. <laughs> because that's, we can actually, look, you know it from your home stereo, Bang & Olufsen, they used to make microphones. Um, and this captures the whole set. It doesn't really capture the symbols, <laughs> to be honest, but I'll blend it in with the other microphones. And to answer your question, no, I don't choose the, the, the balance of the microphones in the mix. I choose them while recording. Mm. I'll sum it all down to four to eight tracks, and that's it. And save a day for all the walls that once surrounded me. Is he in there? Yep. Where? All right. Muxi, you want to say hi? No. <laughs> no, all right. All right, yeah. Bye, you guys. Understandable. Um, so yeah, that's the A room. The Neve room, however you want to call it. That's a vintage Neve 8068 MK2, previously owned by Sir George Martin. And after that, by Daniel Lanoir. I got it from Daniel Lanoir because he sold a couple of his studios or his studio inventory or something that was sitting in a warehouse. But yeah, that was built specifically for... George Martin. He bought it from Rupert Neve himself and that was used on Double Fantasy and a couple of Dylan records and U2 records he did. John Lennon did Double Fantasy in Hit Factory New York. And actually a funny story because I used to work with Omar Rodriguez Lopez a lot like I did the last at the drive-in uh, record in here and Bosnian Rainbows and Omar's latest solo record The Clouds Hill Tapes part one, two and three triple album. Um, Omar's got a studio in El Paso and he's got an API and that was sitting in the B room of Hit Factory. So at some point, my Neve and his API were at Hit Factory together in the, in the B room. Nice. Romantic. A beautiful story. Like in the B room, like in the API room, we have a tape machine and a Pro Tools rig, obviously. Because CloudSill, a lot of the times, is referred to being an analog studio and it is because you can do everything without a computer but obviously we still have all the up-to-date digital yeah stuff that you right. have to have yes yeah, so the way we've been doing uh the roofman record is tracking full band in the live room to this tape machine and then once we have a take that we like they're dumping from the tape into pro tools and if there's any edits that need to be made you can do it in pro tools which Luckily, we haven't needed many edits. Um, Almost none. And then I guess whenever you mix, you will then put it back out on the board and mix. On the yeah, it's, it's always coming out to the board. So we're always listening back through the board. Yeah. Nothing's really done in the box. Sometimes we use a couple of plugins and we would record the mix in Pro Tools if we're not going on tape. Even if we're recording on tape, most of the time, the output of the tape machine is wired to Pro Tools. I see you've got a collection of uh, copycats here. <laughs> Yeah, and I must say, I'm not a collector, and this is not a museum, so everything you see here works. I just collect one specific thing, copycat uh, tape delays. What I like about copycat tape delays is that they change their logo, I think, 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I need to have them all, so look. They have this, this. Oh, yep. that, that's that's a little fatter than the other one, I guess. And one more. There you go. And we got some some nice uh, nice things here in this rack, namely the Fairchild. First time I've ever been in the room with a real one. It's stupid to have a Fairchild. It's really stupid. I can't recommend it because the price 
and what it actually does, it doesn't really make sense or match up for me in any way if that makes sense. Yeah. You should you should rather go for one of these. Yeah, I've never seen these before. That's a reissue of these. The Rode and Schwarz limiters. These are legendary German radio limiters. Yeah, I can definitely read all of that and understand it yeah. very well. Ah, such a nice oh, song. Oh, what a nice click. Yep. Yep. Oh, wow. And that's how you turn them on. Clonk. These are probably the best sounding modern compressors I heard. So they kind of do their own thing. It's not like an yeah. LA 2A no. or a 76. No, they do their own thing. Okay. They're extremely versatile, great sounding compressor. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, amps are still on. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at the B room. When did you, uh, when did all this become part of Clouds Hill? Two th in 2009 or 10, we expanded because we were too busy. I wasn't able to do my own projects because that's, this is a rental studio mainly. People just come here with their own stuff and I just make coffee. But I have a lot of my own projects, so I wasn't able to do that parallel. So I had to build a second studio, plus a friend of mine needed a place for his mastering studio. And I found at the label Cloud Hill, and we needed an office for the label. We might have a look at that later. And this is, what became of that? Yeah, this became the second, um, second live room with a different acoustic and a different vibe than the other one. It's much tighter in here. It's much tighter in here. It's a classic way of designing a studio, a mixture of absorption and reflection. So all the oak wood here reflects the sound while the fabric behind it absorbs it. So the more wood you put here, the brighter and the more alive this room gets. And there's a huge carpet in here because we're tracking guitars and I like the room to be tight for that. Even we're still using room mics for the guitars. Actually, this is yeah stereo setup for guitars. When I produced the uh, Bosnian and Rainbows record, like one of Omar Rodriguez Lopez's side projects, 2012, I think it was. Uh, we just overed up the guitars in, in basically in one take and we set up three amps, one cleaner amp on the left side, one more gained amp on the right side. And back then we had a an amp in the middle and he would sit with me like you do now uh, in the control room with his pedal board and going through three different amps and he could choose the different amps by with like th through a guitar splitter. Uh, same thing, 421 C73. Stereo. Yeah, yeah, stereo. Those are Gefeld's UM70s. Cardio it, well, that's an ORTF stereo array that kind of points not directly on the amps, but a little to the sides to give it more air. And that just makes a supernatural wide stereo uh, picture. Same here. When I track, I decide where I want the guitars later in the mix. Mm. So that's usually the left guitar and that's the right guitar. But you can do all sorts of things. You can, you can sum both amps on the left side and have both room mics on the right side. Right. You can do all, you can just mess around with it until yeah. it feels right. Yeah, I'm going to try this at home. I've never done something like that before. Do it. If you stay there, we have this kind of vibe here too. So as you can see, this is like a super reflective corner. Mm -hmm. Not people think we put drums in here all the time, but that's just too loud. Drummers hate it. So what, what do you primarily put here then? Well, actually, I primarily use it as a reflection chamber for stuff that happens there. Ah. So if the drums are here, I just put a microphone here to have a certain kind of room sound. And if I want the opposite of that, if I want like a super dead sound for drums or for vocals, I just put them here. Oh yeah. And as you can hear, my vocal kind of disappeared, no reflection at all. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, this is completely dead back here and that's a totally different feel. Yeah because there's no wood here and just absorption. And there's a little acute thing happening over here too. You can actually go behind the Neve room to the back of the speakers. And when the speakers are off, this is another ISO booth, but you can see the river follow me. So, 
go. So we actually make re made records in here where people would operate from the Neve room mm -hmm. and have, for example, the band playing in live room one, the drummer being isolated in live room two, and the singer sitting here with an acoustic guitar looking at the river and everyone plays together. And you hear everything. Amazing. Yeah, I love it. There's downtown Hamburg that way. That's downtown Hamburg, exactly. And the balcony with the red bench, that's our label area. Shall we look at the control room? Sure. So this is the API room. Exactly, that's the API room. Vintage API, 3232, 32 channel, split console. Both studios have a tape machine. That's actually not my tape machine. I, we were working with a band from Bavaria very nerdy guys and they would they they wanted to bring their own tape machine of course <laughs> <laughs> as you do yep. yeah when i have a band playing in there like i did the pete doherty record hamburg demonstrations in here on an eight track the entire band was tracked using i don't know 24 microphones but everything summed down to eight tracks wow and it's so cool because then mixing is so easy yeah it's just frup sound and it, it forces you to commit to decisions early totally yeah totally nothing worse than having to decide between takes and sounds in the mix like i would never ever again record three different bass drum microphones right and then have to choose it in the mix mm -hmm. you have to make it work till it sounds great and record one track yep but yeah that's only for the nerds <laughs> A lot of nerds on this channel. Like, <laughs> okay, okay. Then we, then we go there. Then we go further down down the nerd route. You seen one of these before? No. Okay, that's an uh, EMT two fifty one digital reverb. That's a digital reverb. That's the first digital re reverb that was, I guess. <laughs> that's why it is so heavy. But um, those are the controllers. There's a plugin. Oh my also god, this. this looks like a video game from the early 80s. But just imagine, just imagine someone came up with this and you, you would, these days you think it's heavy as shit because it weights like, I don't know, 50 kilograms, that's like 100 pounds. But compared to an EMT-140? Exactly. Look what it used to look before. Before it was this. Uh-huh. Yeah, the entire thing. Plate. It's a plate reverb. It weighs like, I don't know, a thousand pounds, something like that. <laughs> it's super heavy. It's extre like, extremely hard to navigate it into a studio or out of the studio. I actually have to build the studio around it. Right. And then someone came up with a digital version of that, which is like, whoop, like that. <laughs> Still heavy as fuck, but yep. What year is that SG? Um, that's not an SG, it's a Les Paul. Oh, sorry, exactly. So it's a 61? Yep. That's when SG was still called Les Paul. Yeah. That year. Mm -hmm. I don't know which year it was. Probably 61. 61. Yeah. I don't know that kind of stuff, but I, I know the fact that this is a Les Paul, even it looks like an SG. Oh, huh, what? Yeah, it was a Les Paul until Les Paul freaked out that it said Les Paul. <laughs> exactly. And then it became the solid guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Clouds Hill and my very first ever studio tour video. Hope you enjoyed it. I will have all of Clouds Hill information and Johan's information and social media, all that stuff linked down below. I'll also have uh, Tice, Roofman, his Instagram link down below so that when this record we've been recording comes out, you guys can be notified. So huge thanks to everyone for watching. If you want to support the channel, check out the links in the description box down below. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Actually, sounds kind of nice up here. My name is Rhett Scholl, and remember there is no plan B.